and welcome, yeah, afternoon, right? Um, welcome to the session on children and stewardship. Our presenter today is Tim Stammeyer. Um, Tim is an avid academic and thoughtful presenter and champion of the common good. He seeks in all things to glorify God and build up his holy church. Currently, he's the kindergarten through eighth grade coordinator for um, Faith Formation at Sacred Heart Church in Newton, the parish that he grew up in. When not working, Tim enjoys reading scripture, acting in the theater, playing guitar, and writing. In fact, he is working on a completing a full-length novel. Additionally, he's actively uh, discerning a call to the religious life. He's incredibly blessed and excited to speak with you today because he has a passion for stewardship, for the youth of our parishes, and for serving the poor. Please join me more welcoming to this. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you. It's great to have a packed room. I'm really excited to speak with you um, this afternoon. Now, I want to just break the ice a little bit, because some of you may be thinking, how is this 22-year-old presenting on children and stewardship? I'd like to say it for two reasons. Number one, I'm close to childhood, so I can still remember that. And number two is I've worked as now the K-8th through grade Faith Formation Coordinator, and so I've got to work with children over this past year and throughout my entire life in ministry. So we're going to talk today about children and stewardship and why it's important for our children to be good stewards within the church and in their lives. And I want to say that uh, anything I say hopefully isn't going to be this breathtaking, monumental thing, but I hope to say it in a new way that gives you some vigor and some encouragement to return to your churches and the children that you interact in your lives and help us create a new generation, the next generation of good stewards in our church. So before we go any further, I'm just going to pray for us. So if you'll join me in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here together. Lord, I thank you for every single person in this room. I thank you for their willingness to serve you and for their yes to coming on this day and for their yes, for just committing their lives to you, Lord. Um, I'd like to pray for all of us, and I'd also like to pray for all of the children in our parishes, all the children that we encounter in our lives, Lord. May we be good role models to them, may we en be encouraged by them, and may we let them shape what our faith means to us as well. Lord, um, we ask all these things through your most holy name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with a little fun. The big thing is I think that we can have fun both talking about Jesus and in our faith formation programs. I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive, okay? Um, so I would like to give us a little encouragement from Scripture, though, from Exodus 15.2, that says, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. So I thought we'd do a little child likeness and praise him a little bit today. So I brought my guitar along with me. And we're going to, I'm going to teach you a song called Trading My Sorrows. Some of you may know it. It's my favorite song to play with Faith Formation kids. And so we play this all the time in our Faith Formation classes. And so I'm going to play it for you, and then you're going to learn it. Sound good? If some of you were like, I did not sign up for this. Well, <laughs> welcome. We're going. To, I'll give everyone a second to leave the room if they would like to, and then we're going to go just offer it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down. Joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I choose. I'm trading my pain. Ouch. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. So that's how the, uh, the verses go, and then the chorus goes like this. 
As we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. 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 You got it? Sure. Okay, good, because I gave you a rest. So you don't have to worry about it. You're all worried that I don't have to remember this. Okay, so that's how the song goes. Now, you can set your seats for this, but I'm going to teach you a little bit of actions for it, too, okay? Oops. So, they go like this. When we trade our sorrows, we go, I'm trading my sorrows. And um, mine might look a little different. There's different variations, so, but we're going to do it this way today. I'm trading my shame. And we go, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And you can get a little... Funky with it too. <laughs> and then this, it goes the same thing for I'm trading my sickness, and then you can even throw in a chew in there if you want to. Um, I'm trading my pain, and then you can go, ouch. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And then the yes, Lord part goes, as we say yes, so thumbs up, yes, Lord, and make L's. Yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Okay? If, yeah, it's kind of hard. you got to practice a little bit. I've had a lot of practice. So. Um, if you know the actions, do a lot of prep um, so that other people can kind of help to learn that. Because I can't do the actions while I'm playing. So, all right, ready? Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. I'll give a little intro. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down to the joy of the Lord, I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down to the joy of the to the talk moving forward. The first is a little more of a theoretical framework, and we're going to draw on some wisdom from John Paul II and Pope Francis. Um, and then the second part's going to be more of a practicals. So I'm going to share with you some things we've done in our parish that work for us, and hopefully you can draw on some of these ideas as you go back home. Um, so first of all, children, discipleship, and stewardship. Why is it important to us? Um, I would say a couple reasons. Firstly, to pass on the faith. That's so important, especially in our churches and the increasing amount of people who are leaving the church. Um, we need that young generation coming. But at the same time, there is so much wonderful energy among the young generation and even among people that are my age. And um, I've seen this renewal within the church as well. So I don't want to be all in the dumps about, oh, everyone's leaving our churches and it's awful, because there is a lot of hope, but we have to continue to instill that hope in our young people. So there's, uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, those verses say this, the point is this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully, for God loves a cheerful giver. So along with that, another reason why stewardship is important with our children is so that they can be involved in the life of the church. And it's so important to involve them because they are a part of us. And without them, we are less. We're not complete. 
And so having the children be a part of everything that we do with stewardship and allowing them to grow as well is so important. I think the last reason, or at least the main reason among many, is to have and develop and nurture the gifts that they have. So saying, yes, you have a talent, you have time, you have these, maybe not treasure, except their allowances, maybe they can use that as well. Um, even if it's like in the rice bowl campaign, for example. Uh, that Those are so important to be able to nurture and, and include our children and want to build them up with their gifts because everyone has something to contribute to the life of the church. So if we draw on church wisdom, uh, Pope John Saint, Pope John Paul II said this, All the just of the earth, including those who do not know Christ and his church, who under the influence of grace seek God with a sincere heart, are thus called to build the kingdom of God by working with the Lord, who is its first and decisive builder. Therefore, we must entrust ourselves in his hands, to his word, to his guidance, like inexperienced children who find security only in the Father. For whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child, Jesus said, shall not enter it. And this is some um, really poignant words for us, I think, um, because it says, like, we're, we're talking about, like, Jesus is saying that whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So don't you think that we should be paying attention to our children more? <laughs> I think that. I think that it's important that we are able to be reminded by our youth what it's like to be childlike. Because for me, even though I'm not that far removed from it, I've already got caught up, caught up in all of the adult things, you know, like paying bills and all of that kind of stuff. And I've forgotten it a lot of times what it's like to be childlike. And every time I go to faith formation, I learn, oh, okay, this is what being a child is like. Like, this is the childlike joy that I see. And so for us, being able to connect with our children in that way actually is allowing us to grow in our faith and allowing us in a very real way to help ourselves get to heaven. And speaking of heaven, I want to put this out there, that if we're not focused on our children getting to heaven, then what are we doing? You know, if we're not focused, the ultimate goal is to help them grow in their relationship with Christ and ultimately get to heaven, then why are we trying to practice stewardship? Why are we doing all of these things? Because the ch a child's relationship with Christ is so important to connect that head and the heart. So I know a lot of times I felt like when I was in faith formation, and it was really no one's fault, it was just kind of how I felt growing up, was that there was this almighty adult that's like, I know everything, and I'm going to give you a brain dump of all this theological knowledge. Now the wonderful thing is, that theological knowledge and the history and wisdom of our church is so rich. I mean, that's what makes being Catholic, one of the awesome things is we have all of this wisdom from generations and generations, and we have to value that. But we also have to value the heart connection, having our children form a relationship with Jesus in a very practical and real way. So how do we marry those two things? I think those are the questions we need to continue to ask ourselves, is how are we marrying both the head and the heart with our children? John Paul II also said this, in the years of his public life, Jesus often insisted that only those who become like children will enter the kingdom of heaven, like we were talking about. In his teaching, young children become a striking image of the disciple who is called to follow the divine master with childlike docility. And he goes on to say, Jesus had a particularly love for particular, excuse me, love for children because of their simplicity, their joy of life, their spontaneity and their faith-filled wonder. Do you remember what it feels like to have a faith-filled wonder? And those are the experiences that, is, that are so important. Like, do I, all the time, I'm like, I don't have that faith-filled wonder. Like, what is that? And it's reconnecting to accepting the kingdom of God like a child. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. So, I was a summer camp counselor for two and a half years. The half year was just because I had something else to do, not that I got kicked out or anything. <laughs> um, so over the summers that I got to spend at Catholic youth camps in Minnesota, 
which is in a little town called McGregor, Minnesota, about two and a half hours north of the Twin Cities. And so I was at this camp, and the kids had a choice time. So they could choose between nine square in the air, which is like four square, nine square on the ground, except it's up high. They could choose between this really fun game called Gaga Ball, where they're like smacking the ball in this pit, and you have to try to hit someone below the legs. They had a choice of camp store break, which was always a really fun one. And they had a choice of chapel time. Now, chapel time was not as popular as some of the other things, which I'm sad to say. But I was in the chapel and I was playing music. And we were playing some worship songs that they knew, like Trading My Sorrows. And this little girl comes in with another counselor. And she's defiant. And she says, I want to see Jesus. <laughs> and the counselor, in a very responsible Catholic way, responds, well, you can. You can see him at Mass. You know, you can see him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And what a beautiful gift that is on a side note. <laughs> but she's like, I want to see him. And so we had a tabernacle where Jesus was. And the counselor points and says, Jesus is in there. And she goes, in that box? <laughs> Jesus is in a box? I mean, she was like very, um, but it wasn't more like Jesus is in a box. She was like, wow, Jesus is here. Jesus is among us. Jesus is living. He's present. And I tell you that story because that childlike wonder was there. And it can build up the life of the church. And while we led her to Jesus in a very practical way, the child also instilled a new fervor to recognize Jesus, not only in the Blessed Sacrament, but also in our neighbor. So children do have valuable lessons to teach us, and we have to remember that. But like in prayer, we must also listen to them and listen to the voice of God. So uh, Pope Francis talks about being missionaries, missionary disciples and the joy of the gospel. Some of you have probably heard this before. And he says, We no longer say that we are disciples and missionaries, but rather that we are missionary disciples. And so I want to say that our children for sure can be these missionary disciples, that we don't need to hold them back anymore, that instead of just thinking that the child's place is in the classroom and just to learn and to be like to serve in that way or to be served a lot of times um, by the adults, we can also teach our children to serve. And we can teach our children that they can go out and they can spread the love of Christ. That spreading the love of Christ in their classrooms, spreading the love of Christ with their neighbors and those they encounter, spreading the love of Christ in their churches. What an awesome thing it would be if children could be and are missionary disciples in our churches. And we don't think about that a lot. We think of missionaries and these disciples as us, as older, well not older, no offense to anyone, um, but as adults, right? And we forget that the missionary disciples can be our children as well. And they can minister to us, right? They can teach us instead of us just ministering to them all the time. And so I'd like to propose, instead of just a top-down approach, a cyclical approach with discipleship and stewardship with our children. So instead of just us, again, giving that knowledge dump on our children all the time, that our children can also teach us. <coughs> now, our families, a lot of the times, are the first catechists, and so parents and guardians are so important in the life of their children. And I'm definitely not diminishing that at all. But also the children can, in turn, teach us as the adults. So I hope that from that theoretical framework you found some... Um, ideas and things like that, and you enjoyed that part. But now we're going to get into what I really want to talk about as well, and that is talking about some very practical ideas. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is going off of the verse um, from 1 Corinthians that says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So we decided... Luke Gregory and I, and Luke's in the back, um, we decided to make a video to kick off our faith formation year. And Luke and I are by no means professional photographers or videographers. We just took the parish camera, put it on video setting, and decided to go around town and film locations that they knew well, the children knew well. 
And so this is the presentation that we gave on the first day of faith formation with the children and their families. So I'm just going to play that video right now. Let us praise him for his sacrifice, for dying for us on the cross. Let us 
us thank him and praise him for all the fun that we're able to have. Let's be driven by our dreams and not our fears. Let's turn to Mary, the mother of God, when we need help and to lead us closer to her son. And let us know that nothing is more attractive than holiness, that we can do all things in Christ who gives us strength. And let us light up the joy of the gospel let others know that we are Catholic by the way we live our lives. And let us know that saints are just sinners who keep trying. We are so happy that you are here. Keep on climbing toward holiness. Keep on praying for the strength to grow even closer to the heart of Jesus. You are an amazing creation of God. And let us live the faith, live the adventure, live Catholic. The higher we go, the better we shall hear the voice of Christ. fun driving around town. <laughs> so the next thing that I want to share with you is called My Faith Adventure Book. Now we've modeled this off of a the movie Up. Has anyone seen the movie Up? Okay, so if you haven't seen it, it's basically about an older man who is supposed to go to a nursing home, but instead has tied thousands and thousands of balloon onto his house, and when they come to get him, he releases them all and his house floats away and he's going to a place called Paradise Falls where his late wife and him always wanted to go. But in the meantime, there's this an adventure scout and he had gotten, this child had gotten on to his porch before it lifted off. And so he's with them for the ride and they become unlikely friends. So the big thing though is the older gentleman and his late wife had made this book called My Adventure Book. And it was supposed to have all of the pictures and things that they've done together and all the adventures that they had, and then all the adventures that he will have. And so we said, well, that's a cool idea, and kids will know that story, at least in part. So we took it and said, okay, we're going to make our own faith adventure books. So how we did this is we introduced, it, introduced our kids to Father Martin, and Father Martin basically says, Welcome to your faith adventure book. Um, the following pages are for you to put your faith adventure badges in. And these badges are challenges and activities that will bring you closer to God and his Catholic Church. Never forget, Jesus loves you and he is the true prize. So then what we did is we came up with a lot of different badges. So for example, this is the prayer memory badge page and prayer memory is learning prayers like the glory be and once they get the glory be then they get to glue this badge into their book um, other ones are prayer and church life so we have them research five different saint quotes of a saint that they enjoy and hand that in there's acts of service which is like an example is to donate a canned food item and then we have bible memory or scripture memory and these are things like learning the verse Genesis 1-1, for example. So the one that we really loved for stewardship was the Acts of Service badges. So as you can see, there's a whole bunch of Acts of Service badges that we came up for the kids to work on. So again, this is anything like donating food. It can also be an act of service and thanks. So like writing a letter to staff members. All the staff, Newton staff in here, have gotten letters from kids, and they're super cute, and we like to put them on our desks. So that's a really fun thing to do. Anyway, this adventure book is really successful, and it's been really fun in our parish. And then they just glue them on to these blank pages. Check time here. Okay, we're good. So... That's one example, an easy way that we found that we can really incorporate our children and teach them in the ways of stewardship. It was super easy for us to do. We just brainstormed lists of different acts of service that we could do, 
the prayers were already written out for us, so thank you, Catholic Church. We didn't have to worry too much about that. Um, there is some resources on Catholic scripture verses that are helpful for children to learn, so we pulled from those. And then we also asked, well, how do we want our children to be involved in our church? And how do we want them to be good stewards within the church? And so we came up with a list of badges there. This is something that you could take and tweak, um, or something that I encourage you to do with your own youth at your own parishes. So one of the big things, too, is we wanted to create a system that prepares our children for the eternal reward of heaven and not just a piece of candy. Now, I'm not naive. I've had to give out candy all the time to children <laughs> to help them do what, <laughs> do what we want them to do, right? And so those things exist. But we want it as a broad framework to encourage our children in a reward system that was going to prepare them for heaven. And that's really what my Faith Adventure book tried to accomplish was with our badges, while it's a physical badge that they receive, it's more of them being able to reflect on what they did and how they connected to Christ through that than it is um, this material thing. So we tried as much as we can to get away from the material goods and give them something that they can view and take pride in and say, yes, I learned about Jesus through this action. And that was our goal. So some other ideas that we did that I want to share with you are our penny war. Has anyone heard of a penny war before? Okay, so we did this with a CRS Rice Bowls campaign, and we're doing it right now. And essentially what happens is each class has a jug, and they put pennies in it. And for every penny you put in, you get a point. And so the one with the most points wins. Sounds pretty easy, right? But there's a catch as there is with all good competitions. And that is, you can put in nickels, dimes, quarters, dollar bills, whatever other currency you want, into other people's jars. And those deduct points. So for every nickel, there's five points deducted, for every dime, 10 points, and so on. And in one week, we already raised almost $60. So it really worked well. Of course, it's not all about the money, but, it, but children are like, get that competition going, but we've had them see, oh, beyond the competition, who is this helping? And they've even used parts of their allowance and things to donate to this, which has been really cool. The second picture is a watermelon, and what we did for our middle schoolers, I absolutely love middle schoolers. Middle schoolers are my favorite, for sure. Don't tell the younger ones, because um, they're at such a fun age, I think. And what we did is we're like, okay, how do we engage our middle schoolers. And we're like, well, we need to blow up watermelons. That will easily be the best way to engage our middle schoolers. So I saw this online, and we'd done it at camp, and so I said, let's try it. Um, we tested it first, though, so there was no injuries. Don't worry. Um, what happens is we, there's two teams. Each gets a watermelon and about 300 rubber bands, and they wrap the rubber bands as much as they can around the center of the watermelon, and then the watermelon starts to squeeze in, and then everybody backs away, of course, and then the top blows off. It's awesome. I highly recommend you try it, just for yourselves, but then also you can pass it on to the children of your parish. Um, the top one is we had a Saints Carnival, and this is an idea that some other parishes do too. It's super fun. We had all of our kids dress up as different saints if they wanted to participate. So the top picture is just some of the kids that dressed up. And then we had a carnival, so we had the putt, putt, the narrow way golf, where we took a box and we just cut holes in the bottom um, where they can try to putt it into, and we used a putt, putt set. Uh, we had halo toss, which was like ring toss. And my favorite is we had Joan of Arc shooting gallery. So I brought a prop with me. These are marshmallow shooters, so they're really easy to make. We just take a plastic cup, you cut the bottom off of it, and then you cut the top off of a balloon, wow. you wrap it around, and then it makes a marshmallow shooter like this one. <laughs> and so I'm gonna sh I'll shoot it at Kathy so no one gets of hit. Of course. Um, and so basically, it, they shoot really far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> it packs a punch. So. <laughs> Did you have protective eyewear and helmets and all that? Yeah. Well, 
They weren't shooting at each other. Okay. Um, what we were doing is we had targets on the yeah. wall. Good. And so they were shooting at the targets and stuffed animals and stuff. And we had close supervision, so we made sure that I did not fire. offer to sit in the chair and let him shoot. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like the dunk tank. <laughs> right. Um, and then the bottom one is just our Christmas children's choir, which was really fun. And we um, allowed our children, if they wanted to participate, to be in this choir. And our choir director led it alongside uh, myself. And it was just super fun. And it's coming up with ways that our children can take pride in what they're doing, but also can take pride in their church. So again, I really want to encourage everyone that children are such an important and valuable asset in our churches that we want them to continue to be a part of everything that we do. And without them, we are really missing something from our church life and our church community. So with that, we just have a couple minutes um, does anyone have any questions or anything they would like to share? Any ideas that they have that's worked in their churches? It sounds as though you have a group of people to help um, create, brainstorm, you know, uh, these activities that you're doing. Who's, who, who from the parish are part of that planning group, that dreaming group? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's our internal office, and then we have a Faith Formation Commission mm -hmm. that we have, and so this is a group that includes catechists, um, is the head of it, the catechists, and then we have parents on it that's going through different levels of mm -hmm. their children, different levels of formation, and then um, we have people who have children in the program, and then those children have grown up and left. Um, so we do, a, we run a lot of things by them. And then we also are just really lucky to have a really solid team of catechists this year that are really willing to do whatever we ask of them. And so we did a lot of volunteer recruitment and that kind of thing, but it really was, we got lucky with our, with our group too, and they're really amazing. But I think the biggest thing is people like to have an idea, especially that they can kind of go off of. So a lot of times I said, okay, here's the... Here's the idea, here's kind of the dream, how do we do it? And I think when people have that, it was easier for us. Mm -hmm. Instead of, okay, everybody just say what they think we should do, and, and that tended to not work as well. Yeah, thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. And then how do you balance this with teaching mm -hmm. our faith? Right, yeah, so, for our penny war, mm -hmm. a lot of what we do is we take the first five minutes of class time and we do big group things together. And that's really works. So we might play a song, we might do the penny war, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then the rest of the class time is for the teachers. And then for our Saints Carnival, we just took one Wednesday out of the semester, essentially, and did that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do one for Easter, too. So we try just to do one class a semester so they get as much... Um, catechesis time as, mm -hmm. as we can give them. Mm -hmm. Tim, did you want to tell them when you do your badges, though? That's kind of like when you listen to the kids. Oh, What's sure. Yeah, so for um, our badges, we, uh, Luke helps with this too, and beforehand and afterhand, we'll listen to them say their prayers, or they have to give some proof that they did it like a parent note or, or something like that, and then we'll kind of validate that and give them out their badge. And then we also have catechists who will help with that, mm -hmm. um, listen to prayers and things, and some incorporate these good acts with what they're teaching about. So if we're teaching about the love of God, they might do an act of service together, for example. How many children do you have in your education? K-6, we have... 85. Okay. And middle school we have 12-ish, 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. High school I'm not sure because okay. that's somebody else's uh, realm. realm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I think around, I don't know, 20-ish I would say. And all on one day? Um, yeah, so K-6 goes from six to seven on Wednesdays, and then middle school goes from 7.15 to 8.15 on Wednesdays, okay. and then high school is on Sunday. Mm -hmm. 
But you mentioned how good the children are for the church, mm -hmm. but also the children are learning love. Mm -hmm. We're showing them love. I'm mean, there gaining. It's a two-way street. Yeah, absolutely. I had heard you say that. You know that that they are knowing that they are loved by their church, by the people of their church. So. Yeah, it's really a cyclical kind of thing going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. children have to understand what love is before they can right. show love. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. right. Yeah. Is there anything going on in our diocese that is focused on bringing children back to the church? You know, like at our church, kids get dropped off and the parents will maybe even be in the parking lot on their iPhone. Yeah. You know, and I'm trying to get it more of a family, bring the children, bring the family. Is there anything like that, that like the different towns get together and brainstorm together that you're aware of? I don't know. Does anyone else with, know? Not necessarily with respect specifically towards bringing children or bringing parents back into the parish. Within our faith formation leaders and our youth ministry leaders, we meet monthly whether it's in a particular deanery or diocesan-wide, and some of those conversations do occur within that community. Um, Father Verba, you might be able to speak as to whether within the priest deanery meetings there's some conversations, I would assume, at some times along those lines. So it may not be a, an overt, um, everybody in the diocese know, hey, this meeting is happening, but within leadership groups, um, at least on the faith formation side, it is occurring. I, th I think your deanery, mm -hmm. the, the Grinnell Deanery, is probably the, the best ones who have deanery meetings that accompany more than just the priests. Mm -hmm. You know, Grinnell, who's, who's part of Grinnell? Yeah. <laughs> what, was on, what was on your deanery meeting? When you have the, the DREs and... The lay ministers. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like you said, a lot of the uh, DREs and that, we meet separately and then the priests meet mm -hmm. and then um, in the end we meet together. Rosina is our um, staff liaison. She gives us information from mm -hmm. the diocese and shares that with us. Mm -hmm. I think for some deaneries it's just the priests who get together back to the Davenport the deanery and there's not a lot of uh, interaction that certainly goes like with the Grinnell's model. Mm -hmm. which and then we always mm -hmm. have a potluck after. It's even better. Social <laughs> 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 and, and let me just say, Father Verba, the, the ministers meet at a t in, in the other mm -hmm. five deaneries. The ministers do gather. Mm -hmm. They just gather at a separate time from the priests. So mm -hmm. we do meet monthly or bi-monthly with mm -hmm. um, every, every deanery and all the leaders there. So, mm -hmm. excuse me. Yeah. Do uh, your children uh, continue religious ed after they're confirmed? Um, that is always a struggle. Um, I, it's my first year in the parish, so I'm not exactly sure what our retention rate is. Um, but do, do you know? We confirm in eighth grade, so then the next year they'd be going off into high school ministry. And then that definitely is our youth minister for that. So do um, they do they come? Is what I'm asking. A few yes, a few no. Um, so it's not like required. Don't be High school youth ministry is a little different. I think in, in it's the element is not like a like K through six would be, for instance. Okay. You know, like we're gonna specifically talk about our faith and do things like what Tim's suggesting. Both high school, it, it's never required. As K through six is more promoted, so to speak, it's not required for kids to go to K through six, but it's definitely strongly promoted. Whereas high school is a little more difficult. You got the extracurricular activities and everything that's just grabbing for attention. Um, do we do a good job in regards to trying to get high school ministry um, kids involved? Absolutely, but I mean, you could have twenty five kids one night and have fifteen the next. So it's definitely. Um, in the air from week to week, depending on who's involved and how many are there. Mm -hmm. So, the questions that you're raising and the issues that you're raising. I'm I'm a director of religious education youth ministry in Knoxville, and we talk about them all ad nauseum. So, if you guys have answers, we would be happy. <laughs> we would be happy to know them. I mean, there have been just such huge changes in the church in the last 40, 50 years. Such huge cultural changes. 
um, that are still ongoing. So yeah, it's I, I mean it's all being talked about continuously in the church is how do right. we reach so out to asking. children and families and how what do people like you ever meet methods? with other people to brainstorm these ideas? That's yes, at like our January yeah. meetings at diocesan workshops and things that we're at. It's yeah, so there's no it, there's no silver to pull it. I wish no, there was because we'd all be. That's not a good image. And kids are pulled in more and more directions from school and other clubs and everything else. And parents, parents trying to figure out what's the priorities. Well, sometimes the priorities that they think yeah. are maybe different than what we think they are. Yeah, absolutely. I used to have a comment on that. So I've been um, on the ENS commission at St. Patrick's and Iowa City for just a couple of years. And it, yes, you just think like, okay, at first year you're so excited and you talk about all these things and you talk about them and all of a sudden it's like, we have the fair and like, and nobody shows up or, you know, why, why, why? So I think what we've come to, and I don't have any results yet, but what we kind of decided that we have to do is ask. Mm -hmm. So I did just now, like especially with the new, whoever said about after confirmation, what do you, you know, you have to write them a letter and say, this is what's going on. Now you are here and this w is what it means. Mm -hmm. You are welcome now. And that's when we send out the, you know, after that, we don't wait until the fair to say, okay, come to the fair and see where you want to join in to our parish. Then you send them a letter then and send them um, all the ministries that are available. But the follow-up is the main thing. Is I, so I think we need to see the kids in the church. We have a great community. We have Regina Education Center, preschool through high school. So they get you know, all of that right there. We're blessed with that. Not all the members of the parish go to Regina. But, um, so sometimes, like I said, they're involved, they're involved, and then they just go to church and leave for their ball game or whatever. But we have got to ask, and so it is an effort. So we're going to call families and say, can your family either be the readers today, either be the ushers? Can your kids help out with bringing the gifts up? Because it's the same people over and over again. So, And I know I have five boys. <laughs> and a husband who they, you know, they're, they like to watch the ball game in the afternoon or let's get going so we can eat. And so, but I remember one Christmas, I prayed, I said, I hope my kids are in the program, in the Christmas program. And then one time, um, one of the um, secretaries at church came up and said, we need a lecture, we need a couple more um, kings. And, and so then they asked. And I, my oldest was elect, you know, read the Christmas program, and the kids were in. I was just so blessed, and I take that as we need to be asked. Sometimes we don't. We're just so focused in our day-to-day -day activities that we have to reach out to our neighbor, neighbors in the pew that have teens. Hey, are you going to the youth group tonight? You know, can you call my kids up and go? Those kind of things. So I think we're just. It's going to have to be more than talk, but action. Yes. And, and I mean, getting on the phone. My um, co-leader in our ENS commission, we've talked about let's get together and make some phone calls, you know, before our group meeting or whatever. And just call some families that we know, and then they can reach out. I mean, even putting books away at mass, I do, you know, after the masses, you know, just asking other families to do it. So more than talk, we need to to ask. And so when other families see somebody other's kids in church yeah. taking the gifts up, oh, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. hopefully those, something like that. Yeah. I'll let you know next year. Yeah. <laughs> the the thing I've really appreciated about this workshop is that you're talking about uh, right from a young age helping, helping children know that they belong that there's a place for them and that we value them. Yes. I think part of the problem, if we wait until after confirmation to do that, we you, you may as well close the doors. Because, because if young people by that point, as well as their families, don't understand that they're valued, they're loved, that there's a place for them, that their gifts, what their gifts are, and that they're welcomed, um, 
it's just not going to happen after confirmation. Or it's going to happen, it, we're going to continue the pattern that we have. Uh, it's a, today it's about relationship and it's about belonging. And people have to have that sense that because that says I'm valued and my gifts are valued and they're needed by the community. And, and that is what happens. A lot of times I think the issue we have when we're talking about very little people coming after confirmation um, is that we've set up that system and we're reaping the benefits, uh, quote unquote, of the system that, we've, that we have in our parishes. We've got, we, we've got to start thinking about this much, much earlier. And that's what I love about what you, you've shared here because that's a, that's a great model for us. Also, our high schools <coughs> require so much service time um, that they have, even after confirmation, they have to have X number of hours before they are even eligible for, for graduation. Mm -hmm. So that's getting the entire community involved. Thank you for all of your comments. This was very fruitful. Um, I want to get us out of here because we're over time. So um, thank you so thank much. You.